ready to go. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We're almost right on time, so it is this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us here at the uh, Lakatan and Basal Symposium, which, of course, is um, possible through the philanthropy of Gary and Susan Rothwell. Uh, you may have seen the session last night. Um, to begin proceedings, though, of course, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and of course, it is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. And as we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, uh, we may also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Um, very minor housekeeping here. Uh, the session is being recorded, which means it will be available more broadly, which is wonderful. Um, and for those of you who've joined us here in person today, in the case of emergency, will be directed by the museum staff. Um, I'll just briefly introduce our three speakers. Um, if you haven't seen their uh, bios in the documents that have been provided earlier. Um, but I thought, and we've discussed this, that it because of the nature of the symposium, it probably makes most sense for those uh, presenters to talk about their background as a way of introducing their practice in any case. So they know, they know their practice much better than I. And usually people are a little bit reticent to um, talk about their achievements, but I think that's a, a way that they might introduce themselves, hopefully. So first of all, we're going to have Claire Cousins, who established her Melbourne practice, Claire Cousins Architects, in 2005. She's been engaged in projects large and small. The studio has a particular interest in housing and projects that nurture community. Uh, and not insignificantly, uh, Claire is a life fellow and past national president of the Australian Institute of Architects. After Claire, uh, Kino Holland is an award-winning architect and director of fieldwork. And Kino has worked in the industry since 2001 on large and complex mixed-use commercial, multi-residential and cultural projects. And from 2011 to 2019, which is probably most significant in the context of this symposium, he co-founded and was design director of Assemble, a real estate development group focused on projects where design, community and sustainability go in hand in hand. And why I say particularly relevant, of course, one of the things I think that's going to come out of the discussion is this notion of expanded practice and changes in practice and changes in the nature of architectural um, practice in, in general. And finally, we have Rob McGowan, who's kindly joined us from Melbourne. Thanks, Rob. Um, and he, Rob is a founding director of MGS Architects and leads the master planning, design advocacy and urban design disciplines in the practice. Um, he's also a professional fellow at the University of Melbourne, an adjunct professor at Monash, and a board member of the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. And I think the significance of that charitable work and the outreach beyond architectural practice we will be talking about as well, Rob. So, without further introduction, um, Claire, would you like to take control of the screen and introduce yourself? Great, thank you very much. Um, yep, yeah, lovely to be here. I shall start sharing my screen. I don't think there's much more to introduce, <laughs> introduce about <laughs> practice. You've given a good enough introduction, so thank you for that. Um, okay. So I've been asked today to talk about the Nightingale model. Uh, but firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people on the land uh, who are the tra traditional custodians of the land in which I present today. We pay respect to elders both past and present of the Kula Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. So I started the practice about 15, 16 years ago. And for the first 10 years, it was predominantly uh, made up of um, single residential sort of alts and ads and new housing projects. Um, so what makes good housing? Aspect, um, outlook, private open space. I think there's obviously a bit of an, an obsession with um, everyone having their own private open space in Australia. Uh, light and ventilation, pretty um, typical. Flexibility, we think, is really important and how can spaces have multiple functions, um, certainly long-lasting and low-maintenance so that they, um, from a sustainability point of view and also, I suppose, from a, you know, um, being easy to look after. More broadly, it's also having somewhere um, local to shop, places to play, um, you know, a great public realm makes places feel sociable and safe. Feeling safe is also important and affordable to live in and run. 
a sense of community, um, having good neighbours, a place with an identity where people feel they can belong, um, diversity, shared values, combat loneliness and sustainable um, housing that doesn't cost the earth and that energy, ideally, um, we need to now be thinking that energy, waste and water neutral. So ideally a place to call home. It's that place where you return each day. You might live with family or friends, a place where you belong. That means, that means when you design, you put people first. So good design significantly, as we would all attest as architects, significantly improves the function and enjoyment of a place. So why Nightingale? I had worked um, on multi, I had avoided working on multi-residential projects because to be frank, I didn't trust working with developers. In Australia, speculative private development has been the predominant delivery model for multi-residential housing. Owners and investors buy apartments off the plan. The buyer puts a lot of faith in the developer. Some buildings are good, many are bad. In 2014, Jeremy McLeod of Breathe Architecture called me looking for micro-investors to develop a site in Brunswick. He talked about Melbourne's problem with urban sprawl, urban, urban compression and the missing middle. So Jeremy's development was to follow on from the Commons, which had garnered great interest from the public looking for a better housing alternative. Melbourne had so many poorly designed, poorly built apartment buildings. I was keen to contribute in a small way through investing to see a change. This is our images of the commons. So a group of architects each took $100,000 out of their mortgages to silently invest in Nightingale. Um, Austin Maynard Architects, Architecture Architecture, me, Six Degrees, Martin Architects and Woolridge Architects amongst some others. But good design is only part of the equation. And Nightingale One was delivered in 2017. The, the challenge is that with um, is that the, the decision makers in development set the goalposts and often, as too often we've seen lately, that architects are not often at that decision-making table. And most property development, um, to generalise, has been about profit and not about people. So if the system was broken, it was time to design a new system. So after this project finished, actually maybe even just before it finished, it was we decided to embark on our own Nightingale project and, and obtained a licence from Nightingale Housing to do so. And one of the principles um, that Nightingale set about was about this replicable model that, that it could enable a lot of um, architects that perhaps hadn't built multi-residential projects uh, that they could do so. And there was a key uh, focus on the social, the ecological, the sustainable and uh, the financial model. So we had to, the, the first bit though was that we had to find investors. Sorry, just lost my way. Of thought. We raised two, um, 2.4 million from 24 investors, each investing $100,000 into our development, including ourselves. This is the group of um, the diversity, I suppose, of the people who invested in our project um, architects, designers, clients, ethical investors. It's certainly hard work, and I don't like asking for money, but people were legitimately interested and keen to be involved. One of our clients that we did this interior kind of fit out for uh, a number of years ago when I asked him why he had invested um, all those couple of years ago, he had a belief in the Nightingale principles that he'd heard about. He wanted to support quality, environmentally conscious architecture. He was keen to support the development of a community of owner occupiers and wanted to um, contribute to housing affordability for key workers close to employment. So finding a site. We appointed our development manager and project manager, Fontic, who worked with us on numerous feasibilities. We were underbidders on a number of sites, but eventually a collection of uh, 12 lots was up for sale and Jeremy assembled a group of seven architects to build seven individual buildings to create the village just south of the Commons and Nightingale One. So this is Duckett Street. All of these factories will become Nightingale Village and a new home for 203 families. This is our site here, abutting uh, the uphill bypath and also the uh, train line. So this is Duckett Street here. This was the view that you looked through. So five of the buildings uh, nestle or about that, um, about that street. The train line is along through here. Uh, and then there were also other two other sites along the north and the south. Um, this one up the top, which is one that was uh, designed by Wawawa, um, was a, sadly has no longer continued because uh, the city of Moreland, which is the local council, actually ended up acquiring that site to make a new large park, which was very sad to see them go. But 
um, great for the village and the broader community. So this is Wawawa, which uh, was the project I mentioned that's no longer happening. This is our project, Nightingale Evergreen, Park Life by Austin Maynard, Sky House by Breathe Architecture, Courtyard by Hable, Left Field by Kennedy Nolan, and then to the south is Urban Coop. Urban Coop is uh, different to the, sorry, Urban Coop by Architecture Architecture in collaboration with Breathe. This is uh, a different to the other buildings as it's actually a co-housing project. Residents came together over a decade ago trying to find a way to deliver a building together. Their building includes even more shared communal space such as music room, communal kitchen and dining room. So here's the view of their kind of communal space. We also had 15% uh, of the buildings across the village were allocated for purchase by community housing providers and in this case Housing Choices Australia and Women's Property Initiative. Some of the architectural strategies that are key across Nightingale projects is the idea of building less and only building what you need, giving more, housing for people, carbon neutral housing, the allocation of affordable housing throughout the developments, um, removing private ownership of car parking and having a, a high proportion of bike parking, green transport plan and a care, car share hub in this development uh, for both the residents of the village but also the broader community. There are no individual laundries, whereas there's a shared laundry uh, on the rooftop and closed hanging space. Ceiling petitions are taken out of apartments to increase ceiling height and exposed services. And really an opportunity to get to, your, to, get to know your neighbours. Building communities are capped at a maximum of 40 apartments per building. So here are a kind of a sketch of our twin level rooftop. Um, it's on the south side of the building. Um, there's an undercover um, dining space and a landscaped area by Eckersley Garden Architecture, a small kind of hydroponic space that we're still working through with the residents. And then on the upper level off from the common laundry is the closed uh, drying space and more productive garden area. Sustainability principles. Um, so there's an energy recovery system uh, within our uh, building, which we felt was important from, a, I suppose, a thermal comfort, but also from an acoustic um, perspective with regards to the adjacency to the train line, uh, ceiling fans throughout and air conditioning is not included in, traditionally throughout the buildings. We've, we've found though, however, the community housing providers typically because of the age or the health of their uh, tenants, um, air conditioning has been included. There's low embodied energy materials throughout, reduction and simplification through design. We avoid energy intensive and high VOC materials and source local materials where possible. There's embedded electricity and water network throughout the buildings and which lead to lower ongoing running costs. The buildings are completely fossil free, gas is disconnected, uh, renewable energy sources, uh, 24 kilowatt volt to, um, PV panel on our building and 100% green energy is purchased in bulk for the residents. Here we have one of the, um, what's called a tile house. It's a studio apartment, which is 35 square metres um, and was sold for 100, well, there were two of them actually, one was 310 and one was 318,000. So this was, I suppose, a, a little um, apartment that we thought was worth showing in that while some states in Australia have actually mandated the minimum sizes of apartments that we feel kind of strongly as a, as a form of a kind of uh, encouraging people into home ownership and um, in more affordable price brackets, is these kind of entry level um, apartments. So there's still a great sense of spaciousness um, uh, with um, a bit like that reference image I showed earlier of our Flinders Lane apartment where the bed can have a kind of curtain space. It's built up on a platform with storage underneath that it can be used as a bit of a day bed during the day or be screened off. So um, these were very popular and sold quickly. Our residents. 70% of um, apartments balloted were allocated to first time buyers. So rather than uh, the apartments being sold on the open market, it's actually balloted um, through Nightingale Housing. So it's a very egalitarian kind of process. We asked some of our um, residents um, recently, Andy Fergus, who's an architect, Zibi and Christopher, why they wanted to buy into a Nightingale apartment. Um, and they said that there was trust in the Nightingale principles um, that they wanted to live in quality, environmentally conscious architecture. Um, they wanted to be part of a community of owner occupiers and they were looking for a for forever home close to all amenities. So here's one of our um, village gatherings that we had prior to demolition. 
project opportunities. We capitalised on adjacent amenity of the upfield bike path and train line with direct access to the bike store. We looked at how we could green between buildings, but not just for the residents, but for the broader community. We worked with talented Mark Jakes of Open Work on this. So here we have Duckett Street, which um, council agreed, given that it was a dead end, could close. Uh, we still needed to um, maintain uh, vehicular access to this adjacent um, development, but it's something that we've spent um, we're um, funding the cost of converting that to a little parklet. Um, and then up here, um, the, these kind of adjacent edges to the park, and then down here between the two, uh, sorry, between the four southern um, apartment buildings is this residential muse. Seen more clearly here. And I suppose using, you know, the, I've often been you know, fond of the muse that are often commonly seen in London. And this a visualisation from a while ago of Duckett Street's potential. A park close to home. Our building and AMA's building now but a new public park, which has been just recently finished on the northern end of the site. So here we've got Nightingale Village, here's the park. This is our building under scaffold and the park as it's been finished in the adjacency of the train line. Commercial precinct. This is Home One, a not-for-profit that operates out of a 12 square metre tenancy at the bottom of Nightingale One. Where 100% of profits are reinvested into hospitality training for young people experiencing homelessness. The village uh, will have 10 ground floor commercial tenancies. So we look forward to having these occupied by values aligned tenants that will benefit the village, but also the broader community. Development structure. Six buildings meant that there were 12 directors. So it made sense to form another company entity that each building had a stake in, which had allowed us to seek project finance collectively. The thing to remember is that when we, as many of us had established our development companies looking for a Nightingale site, it was before the village was, um, I suppose, found. So we all had individual, completely individual development companies. Seeking finance is a whole new process, which is not the role of an architect. We gained a new level of appreciation of the work and the risk of a developer. Rather than appoint six, building, six builders for six buildings, it made sense to consider one building for the whole project. In order to ensure the tender documentation package was cohesive and felt like a single project, we decided it should be executed by one architect. Each architect developed their building to 50% design development and handed it over to Hable to execute with the design architect's oversight. During construction, the design architect doesn't have a role of an doesn't have the role as the architect, which challenges a number of us, um, but rather as client. Um, so switching roles has been a challenge throughout the project. Some decisions require you to take your architect's hat off to be the developer, director, responsible for delivering a great building to residents and a return to investors. So here we have um, some progress photos of the village as it's been tracking. This is ours under uh, with AMAs under the SCAF. Kennedy Nolan's, uh, some of their precast panels with the oxides, some of our balustrades going up, our entry colonnade. Looking to the future. The Nightingale model has evolved. The micro investing seed funding is no longer required as finance is sourced from larger institutions who have seen what can be delivered and want a piece of the action. The model wouldn't have worked without the original grassroots investors, so thank you to them. The Nightingale housing team has expanded to include in-house development managers and finance expertise to scale up and improve efficiencies. There are, there are new projects in the pipeline in regional Victoria and now Adelaide and Sydney. For us, we are now working with community housing providers on various housing typologies. We're also designing a new specialist disability apartment for people um, with high physical support needs. Located in the middle suburb of Melbourne in a residential street, the developer acquired a double site with an existing permit for apartments with an obligatory wedding cake planning envelope, which us architects typically hate. Um, we've designed a new building sitting within this envelope constraint to accommodate 15 one and two bedroom apartment um, dis specialist disability SDA apartments with a key focus on wellbeing and independence for participants. It's an exciting time to consider alternative housing models. 
Oopsie. Um, whether it be Nightingale or the Assemble model, Build to Rent, Baugruppen or others. We need housing models that deliver high quality, sustainable homes designed for long-term needs of people who live there and their community. And I suppose we asked what our residents are looking forward to. And they said we, when they move into uh, the Nightingale Village, that is, um, the social and emotional connection, becoming a community. They've got a WhatsApp group where they're already planning future amenities and dinners with neighbours and child and dog mining. And they're excited for their new home. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, that was an extraordinary amount of <laughs> material you covered in 20 minutes. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to some questions. Uh, what we might do, though, is just go straight to Kino. Um, are you ready to go, Kino? Um, thanks very much, Rod. Oh, Hello, Akino, everybody. Akino, um, I, I, I wish I could be there in person. Um, should I share my screen? Can I just make one? Sorry, Keno, I forgot to say before, anyone who wants to ask a question, please put it into the chat. And then I, I forgot to say that at the very beginning. I apologise, Keno. No problem. Well, thanks very much, everybody. I'm delighted to be presenting to you today. So um, thanks very much for that introduction, uh, Rod. And uh, thanks, Claire, for your talk. Uh, before we get started, uh, we'd like to acknowledge that the project that I'm going to be presenting today lies on the traditional lands of the Boon and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend uh, this respect to other Indigenous Australians who might be present. So fieldwork, uh, we founded a little under eight years ago. Um, I suppose we started really focusing on multi-residential, you know, kind of really uh, I'm very interested in, in housing generally, and uh, we've been able to work with some terrific developers uh, in Melbourne to deliver um, some projects we're very proud of. We've also been uh, working on uh, office buildings. Uh, so there's a number of office buildings under construction and uh, completed. Uh, and since um, uh, last year, we also had our first cultural project completed, which is the Collingwood Yards project um, in Collingwood. Um, so that's the first of our cultural projects, which is really exciting for us. And now we're also working, uh, we've, we're working on aged care. Uh, we're doing a, a couple of schools um, and also a social housing project at the moment as well. So uh, sort of diversifying there. Um, for a little bit of historical context, um, with my business partner, Giuseppe De Mayo and Ben Keck, we founded Assemble many years ago now. Um, and the intention uh, originally for Assemble was to really try and put design and the needs of the residents front and center. I'd come back from Denmark, really inspired by the co-housing models I'd seen over there and wanted to try and do something like that here in Victoria. Um, the resulting building is in Rosemead Street, Clifton Hill. I actually live in the building, so it's a bit of a living, breathing laboratory for me. I've learned an enormous amount uh, living in a building that I've designed along with uh, a large community, so it's 49 apartments and 18 townhouses. Now, um, up until early last year, I was design director at Assemble. Uh, since then, I've, I've stepped away from uh, Assemble day to day. It's now got a very dynamic new team and a really expanding portfolio of properties. Um, and really, Assemble's um, mission is, is to um, provide very well designed sustainable houses and, and to improve access to housing for people. Um, Assemble uh, has, a, a, there's a 25% share in Assemble which was purchased by um, Australian superannuation. So they've got a very big connection to superannuation now. Um, and also they've recently uh, announced a partnership with Housing Choices in order to deliver within Assemble projects a component of social and more affordable housing as well. So that's very exciting. And now Assemble has got um, a large pipeline of several thousand uh, apartments. And the project I'm gonna to talk to you about today is Macaulay Road in Kensington. It's the first project we have designed for Assemble to be delivered under the Assemble Futures model, which is an alternative pathway to home ownership. The way it works is that residents sign up to a five-year lease and then an option to buy at the end of that five years at a pre-agreed price. 
So what this does is a couple of things. First of all, it gives people uh, a very safe, uh, very stable rental for five years, and then a fixed goal to work towards uh, at the end of the five years, so a fixed price to work towards. Assemble supports the journey through financial coaching, bulk buying initiatives, um, to really sort of assist people uh, to be able to purchase the home at the end of that five years. And what I love about the model is it also creates a fantastic alignment. And Claire touched on it before. There's a lot of mistrust of developers out there, but the residents and Assemble projects uh, through the Assemble Futures model, because um, it's worth noting Assemble is doing build pure build to rent as well, but through the Assemble Futures model, there's a really fantastic alignment between the interests of the residents and the developer. And as an architect, I love sitting between that because, because the residents are able to have this five year, in a way, try out the building before they decide to buy it. It means we've got a design of building which ages very well, that is actually a beautiful building to live in. So as I talk through the project, I'm gonna to talk to really what are the design characteristics that we've imbued the building with that take it beyond the sort of conventional apartment building. For the first project, we did a lot of surveying and research and workshops with prospective residents, and that, that research has really fed into what the project is. I should also notice we, uh, note we found an Assemble Papers, a publication which continues to thrive to this day. And uh, when our friend on the right-hand side there picked up a copy, it was a, it was a career highlight for me. It was a uh, workshop we did together. Um, so the project is located in Kensington. It's a working, it was a working class suburb northwest of Melbourne. It's gone through a lot of gentrification now. It sits to the north of a large sort of, I suppose, industrial complex and railway complex um, and uh, adjacent to the freeway. So our site is in the middle. It really sits on the border between um, what used to be light industrial and is rapidly transforming into residential and commercial. And then you can see in the bottom left-hand side of the screen, um, remnant pockets of Victorian workers' cottages. The building itself uh, on the site um, is designed by Harry Norris, who's quite a well-known um, Art Deco era architect in Melbourne, has done some beautiful buildings. And we were very keen to preserve as much of the building as we possibly could, both from a sustainability point of view, but also from a, I suppose, historical and, and sort of fabric point of view. Um, interestingly enough, the building uh, it was used up until we started the project uh, as a CD uh, burning factory. And, and fascinatingly enough, a lot of CDs are still burned in uh, Australia uh, for commercial use. An ongoing interest of ours in field work and a personal interest has really been these six-pack walk-up apartments that were built between the Second World War and the sort of 80s. They're scattered throughout the suburbs of um, Melbourne. And one of the characteristics I really love about them is the external circulation spaces. And a lovely feature is that very often the residents actually start to inhabit those spaces. So you see little moments of, um, you know, pot plants and bicycles and even people sitting and enjoying that. So that's been a real inspiration for the circulation spaces of this project. I also lived for 10 years in a Victorian terrace house. This is not my house, but it's, uh, this is a classic sort of example um, uh, where that front veranda creates this really lovely uh, threshold between private and public. Um, so each of these houses has got a private backyard, but this little interface for me is quite fascinating. And I really wanted to try and introduce that notion into this particular project. And, and there's a particular, um, because Assemble, you know, it's not just about squeezing as many people as possible into a building. It's actually going, well, how can we make the connective tissue of the building, you know, the things that holds all the apartments together into something a little bit richer, into something that actually is conducive to getting to know your neighbors, a space you can inhabit. And so my observation of this sort of threshold space is actually a lovely space to meet your neighbors. So this is an axonometric view of the uh, existing building. A typical approach would likely be putting a corridor in the middle and then apartments around the edge. Instead, what we did is split the building open uh, and that allowed us then to have external circulation spaces um, and what this does, it just fundamentally changes the way the building works. It means that most of the apartments have got north and south light. 
It means it works fantastically from a, a cross-flow ventilation point of view, but it also means rather than sort of walking along a darkened corridor to your apartment, you're actually in this lovely external space as well. I'll talk as we go through the, the project about all the communal spaces, because that's a really big focus um, with Assemble. So an axonometric view of the building and the front elevation. So what we really try to do is make it a very, very simple building. And it's a lot of the principles that Claire uh, talked about have really, um, you know, we've taken similar principles in the sense that we're trying to make this a building that ages gracefully, that we're not building anything unnecessary, that we're focusing on the things that are going to make it a nice place to live. So a big focus on thermal and acoustic insulation, materials which will age very well, very strong sustainability agenda. It's got a very large uh, 35 kilowatt um, system on the roof. Uh, it's a fossil fuel free building uh, as well. Uh, the front, the side elevation, so you can see we really retained uh, the building on the base and not just sort of retained the facade, but made sure it had that sort of depth of, of rooms behind as well. The materiality is very simple. It's vertical ribbed uh, white concrete. Um, so something that will age well. And then at the top of the building, um, you can see the sort of cantilevered bridge uh, out there as well, which is adjacent to the communal room. Um, I'll take you through uh, the plan starting at the ground floor. Now, through all the research we did and also uh, talking a lot to the prospective residents, we actually made the decision to include car parking in the project, but it's done in a bit of an unusual way. Because we, we do have a lot of prospective residents who have work vehicles, for example, or families. And there's also a very broad demographic that are moving into these buildings. So there are people with mobility needs. Um, so the decision was made to provide car parking. But it's done in an unusual way in the sense that uh, the car parks are actually uh, owned for the five, first five years by Assemble and rented out to the individual tenants, uh, those of them who want them during the five years. And then at the end of the five years, the ownership of the whole car park goes across to the residents collectively. Uh, and then the residents could then get together and decide if they want to continue to be renting out the individual car parks to the, temp, to the um, owners of the building. Or in the future, if car ownership patterns change in some way, um, that could be repurposed uh, for something else. Uh, so that's really trying to allow that sort of flexibility. Now on the ground floor, we've got a very large, generous lobby entry space. Adjacent to the lobby, and this is one of the first features I'll talk about, is we have, um, we have a, um, a multi-purpose communal workshop space. Now we did a lot of analysis of what are the disadvantages of living uh, in an apartment compared to say a freestanding house. And one of the things was, you know, a space to tinker around like a shed. So we've done a multi-purpose workshop here, which is going to have laundry facilities, a big workbench. Uh, I should note that all the apartments have got their own little laundry space, but then there's a shared laundry as well. So some people might decide to turn that laundry into a little study uh, or storage, for example. And by putting it next to the lobby, it also becomes a little social moment. So someone might be tinkering away on their bicycle and as people come in, um, it will be a, a lovely sort of interface. Um, there's also a lending library. So the lending library is going to be a space, and we've got one actually at Rosneath Street, Clifton Hill. It's got all those sort of items that would really, you'd like to use very rarely, but doesn't, it's not worth sort of buying them. So things like a slow cooker, there's a sous vide uh, sort of machine, there's a dehydrator, all these sort of things that you that sort of nice have pasta maker uh, in that space as well. Also, we're working with Six Degrees. So the lovely people at Six Degrees are doing an interior design for what's going to be called the assemble space. It's a ground floor. Um, it's really a multi-purpose type space with a focus on hospitality, but they can also be used by the residents in the building. And it's also an amenity for the broader community. Going up through the building, you can see uh, this is the, the, the floor plan where you can start to see the bridges and links across. Uh, so you can really see that each apartment has got almost a little front veranda and then the living spaces and bedrooms around the bathroom. And then everyone's got their own private terrace. So that little bridge really becomes that interface between private and public, which I mentioned previously, like the front veranda of the Victorian Terrace House. Um, the, the lift and stairs, so the staircase is an open stair. I should comment on this curved shape here. So we worked very closely with Assemble and the builders to try and 
you know, I suppose make sure it was incredibly efficient in terms of the construction. And uh, the builders suggested they wanted a spot to put their crane through the building. So originally I was, oh, this is going to be a disaster, this terrible big hole in the middle. But then we turned it into this lovely curve and I think it's going to be a beautiful feature. So that's where the, the tower crane is sitting currently. Uh, on this level, we've also got some further amenities, some further communal amenities. So one thing is uh, external undercover uh, clothes drying lines. Um, a large sort of herb garden uh, and a kids play area and dog run space. So really these buildings are designed so that you can have a very complete life, you know, where you can have dogs and kids and all that kind of thing. It's a very relaxed sort of architecture. And there's also a dog washing spot there. So these are things that through our research, we're like, well, what will actually improve people's lives in these apartments? It's not gyms and swimming pools and things like that. It's actually practical uh, things that will help people um, have a good life there. So here you can see the, it's a real mix of uh, two bedroom uh, and three bedroom apartments. There's some one bedroom apartments on the lower levels. Um, a sectional view through the building really showing that four and a half meter wide external circulation space. And so what that has is a series of handrails and then um, stainless steel mesh. So it's going to be a quite open uh, sort of a space and there's quite extensive landscaping through there in a series of planter boxes. Um, this is the northern um, uh, elevation so you can really see um, you know that there's deep eaves towards the north uh, and you know each apartment does have a sort of light from both ends. So here's an image of what we hope that space will look like. And well, in fact, it, uh, it is starting to look like this. Obviously, the residents haven't moved in yet, but the construction is due to be finished uh, in a couple of months' time. But we're really hoping that the internal light of the building spills out onto these spaces and it becomes a much more positive space than uh, a typical sort of circulation diagram. That's a, a, an image on the right-hand side there of that tower crane, uh, curved space that cuts through the middle, and it'll be a lovely void that brings light right down. An axonometric views through one of the apartments, I suppose, further explaining the typical arrangement of that sort of front veranda, and then the circulation space out here, and then stepping in uh, to the kitchen, dining area, living space, and then the private terrace with, with planter box, and then two bedrooms, and then this one's got two bathrooms. A cross-sectional view through it, so you can really see that on the right-hand side is that totally private space, and on the left-hand side is the semi-private or semi-communal space, which is the walkway. So rather than having, you know, opaque glass or, you know, what we didn't want to do is create privacy but lead, that might lead to sort of isolation, we've solved the idea of privacy through curtains. So what we've got is curtains that can be pulled across, and, you know, our inclination is that people will keep these open a lot of the time. Our level one on Rosneath Street, where I'm living, has got a very similar arrangement. And during the day, most people just have their, their blinds uh, or curtains uh, open and sort of wave to the fence as they walk past. Um, the other sort of important amenity, which is provided uh, in assembled buildings and is being built into this one, is a multi-purpose communal room. So the idea here is it's a space that's very flexible. It's almost like a shared little scout hall, you know, that everyone's got, a little school hall that everyone gets to, to use. And, and what it really is, is a space that any of the residents can book through an online system. We've got one at Rosneath Street, and it's been really fabulous. You know, it's a 65 square meter space. I've had two of my um, kids' birthday parties there, and, uh, and there's a lot of things that go on there. There's yoga classes and Pilates and uh, a lot of resident organized things. So this is on the top floor of this building, so it's got the very best views and very best amenity, and an axonometric study. So we try to layer a lot, lot of functionality into this communal space. So it's got a barbecue type area. It's got a little kid's sort of nook with a curtain uh, with a bit of a library space, a bathroom, a kitchen space, and then a little outdoor terrace. And it can be configured in lots of different ways. We also set it up so that it could um, it's got, you know, flooring and uh, tile data. It's got flooring, which is a lovely marmolean. It's a marmolean, which is a linseed-based um, flooring, which is very lovely to actually touch. So that, that's good for sort of playing and, and yoga and so forth. And we've also, you know, got things like a projector in there to, uh, you know, create a bit of a sense of occasion if they want to be a bit of a movie club. Um, and a lot of people actually at Rosneath Street do get together and, and sort of watch movies. Um, and that's an image... Uh, uh, of the space. Um, and so you can imagine that what this does is it, uh, you know, along with the multi-purpose workshop, 
the lending library, the circulation spaces, um, the communal amenities on level one, you know, the, the dog and kid play area, um, the washing lines. Also, the way we sort of configure the building uh, and this amenity here is that we really hope it's going to foster a, a positive community. And it's not about everyone sort of becoming best friends. It's about creating, you know, the, an armature that will encourage neighborliness, that will encourage, um, you know, it being a positive place to live. And, and this has really been built on the learnings we've had from Rosenith Street, which has certainly got a lot of these components uh, in it. Um, and uh, not a terrific photograph, but just a sort of quick snap showing you where the construction's at. So it is very close uh, structure, it's topped out and uh, fit outs are happening at the moment. Um, uh, and uh, I'll say thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Uh, thanks so much, Kino. Um, I think it's fair to say that the whole symposium can be summarised as how do we live well in the city? And that was what was said last night, of course. And I think it's just in passing, um, you know, the particular attention that you've given to the social interactions and the potential for neighbourliness in, you know, high density development, but also a couple of other terms that came up last night, which was a mixité, <laughs> which we'd call mixed use or a mix of different functions which really can be possible on so many places. And we saw that in your work too, Claire. And then the other one was uh, Precision, which was, I think, the Precision in terms of your very close observations of the very uh, intricate way that spaces might be utilised. You know, the front veranda and then the generosity that also came up last night in circulation, but also in those, those provisions of other things other than the housing to complement it. I think it's um, you know, so evident in what you've just shown. But without more from me, now over to Rob. <laughs> so is my presentation. Excellent. Welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners past, present and future of the land on which we meet today in Sydney. I'm very pleased to be up here, the Gadigal people and the, of the Eora Nation. And uh, the project I'll be talking to you about is on Wurundjeri land um, in Melbourne, and I also pay respect to their traditional owners, past, present and future. So, um, I'm not going to show you lots of our projects today, only one. Uh, if you want to look at our projects, um, please uh, refer to the website. But I thought it'd be worth talking a little bit about how we work, because we're a little bit different uh, in that respect. Um, we are multidisciplinary, like many firms, um, but we also seek to be uh, political. Um, in how we operate and, um, and uh, we also seek to operate as a, um, a research um, uh, led design uh, group and we've had ongoing very positive relationships with universities in the research space for at least the last 25 years uh, as well as teaching programs uh, within the universities. Um, the lens um, that we um, want to undertake our work through um, is one that's predicated on why we exist and that's to make positive impact through what we do. So um, that's supported in the practice over uh, the time we've been in practice since 1985, a culture that is um, curious, deeply committed um, to making impact um, and engaged, values driven, design led, collaborative and interdisciplinary and importantly um, um, the, we like to think when we look at each of our um, completed work, uh, works that they are of the place. Is it going to work? Yes. Um, over time um, and based on the um, interests of leaders within the practice um, and uh, uh, what the, um, where their skills lie and where their passions lie, we've identified a series of impact areas around which we seek to punch above our weight uh, and to influence um, and to subvert if you like, where we see market failure. Um, 
And we like to influence through that the shape of our cities and the institutions that serve them, the priorities for government action, the relationships between communities, philanthropy, governments and institutions to tackle wicked problems, the role that design and design thinking uh, combined with clear purpose can play, and, um, and continual review informed through uh, engagement with our research partners on um, what are the wicked problems of the time that need to be addressed. Um, those areas of focus are exclusively, but not, um, 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 sorry, are, are particularly, but not exclusively based on city-based issues. Um, they are always concerning wicked problems um, that we're uh, needing to address today, where the unique um, strengths and capabilities of the places and people and uh, clients in which we're serving can, we think, lead to positive transformation. Pre-pandemic, um, Melbourne and the Western world was facing a housing problem. Uh, now we're facing a housing crisis. Um, Osman House um, that I'm speaking to you today about um, emerged in the 1950s as a um, an, um, an organisational focus for the delivery of homelessness services post-war in Melbourne and followed a tradition of um, great um, uh, community-based organisations um, and institutions um, engaged in this space. Um, they um, had uh, recognised, however, that um, whilst pre-pandemic we had a surge in homelessness and unaffordable housing, uh, rough sleepers, couch service, surfers and so on, um, that flagged, like canaries in the coal mine, larger systemic issues, um, we're now seeing the floodgates starting to open across the Western world. Um, and um, in Melbourne, Sydney, etc., we've seen some politicians and, and others celebrating um, a housing boom, uh, people celebrating the fact that they own 29 houses at 29 years of age, um, and this sort of thing. But equally, we're now seeing uh, people escaping family violence, um, people who can't meet rent, um, living in regional areas as well as cities, um, um, who are necessary for the under underlying functioning of our economies, but also important to the fabric of the, the communities in which they've existed for many years. So solutions need to be uh, found. Um, part of that uh, opportunity we felt was um, came about when we were approached uh, by Vincent Care, um, who, having run Osman House uh, since the 1950s, really felt um, that they needed to do more with less. They needed to um, uh, ramp up the um, the diversity and um, extent of services that could be available to people in a day specialist hub, um, addressing um, in particular people who were at risk of homelessness, um, homelessness or, um, or who were um, experiencing it, but also to provide people a way out of that cycle, that six week in and out of uh, homeless support back onto the street and around it goes again, which was being perpetuated more and more as there was an absence of a pathway out of that. So this was this idea of having both the services in an integrated and client-focused way to make real transformational change, but to back that up with a pathway to home. The site uh, that they'd occupied uh, since the mid-20th century is on one of the great gateways into Melbourne Flemington Road, opposite the Royal Children's Hospital. In the background there is the old nursing quarters of the Royal Children's. And Osmond House, as it was, is this um, site in the foreground here, single storey behind the walls. The 
service provision within the facility, whilst terrific in its plan and, uh, and what they sought to provide was really undermined by a physical environment described by the residents that we interviewed and the staff as um, having perceptions of being unsafe, scary, institutional, uh, noisy, inflexible and unsuitable. Um, and um, where they had a few days respite but then were again back on the street. The accommodation proposition uh, that we sought to um, put in place challenged us really to combine this holistic approach to service with this what did a pathway to home mean uh, for these people. Um, uh, we worked with um, Vincent Care on the proposition that this pathway would combine short stay accommodation which was very typical in homelessness facilities with uh, medium term accommodation, typically up to um, 18 weeks to 26 weeks um, and then for some long term accommodation. But during this time progressively people were being helped to be well, um, to be confident, um, to have the um, soft skills and hard skills um, to succeed um, and um, so it was up to us to provide the physical environment um, that uh, really conveyed those values um, and uh, the science underpinning what we did to um, support that pathway to wellbeing. So the model um, that um, I'm talking about here was very extensive. You know, the, the day centre on the left hand side really provided very comprehensive services in one spot that might typically have taken Vincent Care two to three weeks to get wraparound services for a client could be delivered in a day. So really profound um, changes to a client focus and to, as a result, um, outcomes. Resident accommodation, as I've said, much more diversified, and I'll take you through that. And resident services um, that were available to those residents living on site that uh, went from everything from training um, on site, uh, certificate training in courses that would help them get employment um, uh, after leaving the facility um, and confidence um, and engagement with the community um, to um, fitness and wellbeing because many of them had uh, physical um, issues as well as health issues that uh, where uh, activity could um, assist, a range of events, um, IT so that they could connect again with family, community etc. Places to charge their mobiles, cook a meal, wash their clothes, have a shower but also library uh, facilities and, um, um, and social spaces. The project really amalgamated a series of diverse and dispersed sites into one. Uh, Vincent Care sold those other sites as part of its equity into this um, development. Um, the uh, not-for-profit philanthropic that I'm now part of was the uh, founding uh, investor in developing the business case um, for uh, the proposal and, um, um, and their initial confidence to invest $750,000 generated a $46 million investment in the site um, that's delivering housing for um, 154 um, residents and uh, meals to uh, 500 um, uh, people outside the facility each day as well as um, 250 people per day who uh, access uh, the facility on a day basis. It's a remarkable location opposite the Children's Hospital on a gateway, one of Melbourne's great gateways, Flemington Road into Melbourne, after you come through the zipper um, and um, into that uh, uh, boulevard. It's the arrival point to uh, Parkville, the Parkville uh, iconic knowledge and uh, health precinct. And we felt in its location also had a civic role in talking to the values of Melbourne in um, how we express the building. 
the, the idea uh, for the, the project at that broad architectural level can sort to continue um, our exploration in our work, if you look, go online and look at it, of urban renewal and social inclusion. Um, in particular, um, how do you develop um, high density communities that connect to place, but also speak to both collective and individual identity? Um, the importance of city scale as well as street experience. Something happened here? Hello? Buzzer not working. Reason? It's not working. Sorry. There it is. Good. Excellent. Um, no? Something happening again? It's there on the right hand side. Um, the, the design proposition really aimed to propagate this idea of the distinctive program whilst responding to very, very specific client physical, social and psychological needs. Um, we wanted to leverage the unique attributes of this remarkable location opposite Royal Park Um, and for, tho for those who haven't experienced the trauma of homelessness, there's um, institutions, rooming houses and the abuse, health crisis or violence that led to it, um, they mightn't be aware of how important it is to go beyond what I've heard to, uh, in uh, the case of some firms recently doing affordable housing, vanilla commercial apartments, to really thinking more carefully about what sort of environments are needed to help people heal, reconnect, and, and how we need to organise space to make uh, that journey easier, safer, calmer, and more domestic um, um, as, as an experience. Part of the interesting work that we've learnt through our engagement with the universities over a period of time has been the value of salutogenic and biophilic design um, in how we uh, and how we interpret that through an architect in the work, you know. Um, and that is, there is a lot of science, particularly through the health sphere now, about how we can, through architecture, contribute to the well-being of those who engage with that architecture. So we've sought to invest this project with that. Just quickly through the methodology, and this will be a bit stroboscopic, but the existing site went street to street. We changed that to being exclusively off this beautiful main boulevard opposite the children's with the central entrance to the uh, day centre and a southern entrance or a city side entrance to the independent living, medium and high density housing. We created a high level of transparency and programming between the street and the uh, facility, unlike the earlier um, um, arrangements, and a real opportunity for social engagement between the two. We used the um, uh, scale of the adjoining nursing home um, to, or nurses' premises to think about, to think about how we could um, develop this, you know, if you like, vertical village. Um, uh, in this location and how through pivoting that uh, form and setting it back from the street we could both talk to the neighbourhood 19th and 20th scale, century scale to the north um, and the, the amenity needs and the, pro, um, and the juxtaposition of the building towards Royal Park um, within uh, that form and then to scale it down to this um, uh, um, human scale that we were uh, seeing as important uh, to the street. The central community areas, if you like, emulated the location of the backyards uh, in the adjoining areas but also extended vertically through the building. And green roofs, both active green roofs and um, green roofs to be occupied, connected the building to the adjoining Royal Park. And this is how the building uh, formed itself. Organisationally, 
um, if you arrive at the building um, um, through the, into the day centre, uh, the concierge um, here is um, uh, able to direct um, somebody arriving um, uh, and triage them into uh, specialist uh, services if they need them and through to social spaces that include the hole in the wall cafe manned by residents of the facility getting training um, and the lounge facilities opening into the large courtyard and meeting place, spiritual space for um, residents, um, uh, combined uh, music and um, practice rooms and uh, multi-purpose space, um, laundries, showers, etc. if they need that, dining space opening onto that uh, northern courtyard um, as the day centre experiences. And for those in medium and long-term accommodation, their separate entrance takes them into a separate set of lifts where they've also got access to gym, library and those other facilities. After hours, uh, whilst parts of the building close, those residents living above have access to all of these same facilities at ground level as well as the courtyard. At uh, first floor level, uh, the administration of the facility, uh, we have the, uh, a central uh, small social space and really um, higher care short term accommodation uh, where people still get an en suite uh, but don't have separate uh, food preparation areas at those um, uh, lower levels. But as they um, uh, embrace programs that um, assist them to uh, develop the skills to uh, move into community. Um, they uh, move into bed sitter type accommodation or studio type accommodation with their own kitchenettes. Each floor has social spaces opposite the lifts to encourage serendipitous meeting. Um, and then in the upper levels, independent living units are uh, much more conventional uh, apartment layouts with separate bedrooms, living areas, kitchen. Um, they still have a common social space and an, their own outside um, smaller uh, terrace as well. You'll see in the organising of this, it's always been about creating small communities or neighbourhoods um, within the development. Um, this is how the uh, building was formed, but I'll take you on a quick run through the, the building. I mean, uh, the practice has always been interested in this um, crafting of buildings and um, I suppose enga engagement with um, the civic story of cities um, and being generous really in how buildings engage with social space. So the seat has become a very popular place for students waiting for the tram, people waiting for their coffees and having a chat, not just residents of the building and the high level of transparency takes away that mist, uh, I suppose mystery but also a sense of other uh, that was characterised the previous facility. I've, through the rest of this you'll just see some quotes um, uh, from um, the early research that's been done by department, um, uh, university, etc. on uh, findings uh, which are incredibly positive in terms of uh, changing people's lives and futures. But uh, here we have the triage desk uh, looking the other way towards the hole in the wall cafe um, uh, serving outside to the courtyard and the street as well as inside to the social spaces, lounge areas, um, etc. beyond and learning spaces, courtyard, uh, looking up to that vertical garden space that I'm pleased to say is now lush, um, dining spaces, laundry, uh, library areas on the lower levels, then through the separate entrance and their uh, journey up through the building um, to, I'll go past the staff spaces, but you can see this idea of the lounges and those seating spaces uh, next to the lifts at each level to again just create those serendipitous opportunities. Moving up through the building, each lounge and each level having their own character and difference and rewarding people as they go from that journey from um, short term to medium to long and then into communities. So importantly for some, it will be their long-term accommodation um, because of their vulnerability, but it's also to help all residents of the building 
um, build their sense of physical and emotional safety and be uh, the best people that they uh, can be and uh, have the best opportunities that they can have. And I just wanted to close with this, which is really uh, something that's coming into sharper relief by the day. Um, but don't think this is somebody else's problem. You know, we can all become homeless through bad luck. It could be, and this is a quote from um, one of the gentlemen that was interviewed. And, you know, I've, um, uh, through my uh, work in the not-for-profit sector, seen remarkable stories um, uh, of how this is happening. But now, with this explosion, as I said, of family violence, with this rapid gentrification that we're seeing, um, people who wouldn't have dreamt of being in that position are finding themselves in that position by the day, and it's only going to get worse if we don't get serious government intervention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, well, uh, uh, if you'll bear with me for just a moment, just in reflecting on what we've just seen. Um, it does, and I'll lead into some questions, but um, as you know, this symposium is meant to kick off the Chair in Architecture Design Leadership. And I think you can see why these speakers were invited to present. Because if we, we're well aware of the problem, so clearly put by you, Rob, not just now, but in your work. But the question then becomes, what is the role of the architect, perhaps, in dealing with these very intractable questions? What is the unique capacities and abilities that architecture has over project managers, engineers, no disrespect to those professions, but what is it that makes us capable of even thinking about these things? And it did strike me that the starting point has to be those values. Yeah. There's, there's actually some fundamental values and motivations that exist in practice as, as part of the practice, part of the ethos of a practice. And then just from this presentation, it strikes me we can discern a, a progression, if you like, from recognising the problem and then the, that stimulating research, yeah. that research leading into understanding the processes which then become manifest in precedents, in prototypes, in testing, in disruptive projects that start to build trust. That also then starts to talk about a different relationship with clients. And so what you then have is then the possibility of that design also coming full circle back to thinking not just about the design of the building, but the design of processes, the design of financial structures, the design of relationships, which I think we've seen in, in all of the projects we've, we've, we've just experienced. So my question, <laughs> uh, first question, and I have four. The first question is to do with research, Rob. Yep. Um, if you wouldn't mind reflecting just on how your research is fed across into education, and to close the circle completely, how that research now um, has actually gone back to inform policy yep. and we were talking about this briefly before, how the full circle is now actually reconceiving affordable housing as infrastructure, which has yep. a whole lot of implications in terms of funding and government acceptance and so on, yep. based on research. Yeah, so it's a really um, interesting uh, question. I was uh, talking about, talking to a colleague at the uh, Future Fund not long ago and, um, and asking, oh, do you invest in housing? And they said, yes, we do, and um, a number of billions. And I said, really, where? And they said, well, none in Australia, uh, because there's no investment vehicle in Australia for future funds to invest. We only have investment vehicles for mum and dad investors globally to invest here. But um, the value of research, um, um, ha both from a practice point of view and the role of the academy in supporting that research, I think, has been profound in changing um, futures in Victoria in the last, um, I'd say, uh, seven or eight years in particular. Um, Carolyn Weitzman and Transforming Housing at Melbourne University uh, led a really interesting body of research. There's a lot of really good work online um, there, and that's been followed up um, by uh, the Hallmark Initiative at Melbourne University, and Shane uh, Murray and Leanne and others at Monash have also been doing some great work with Swinburne also doing some uh, good work. But what that has been able to 
uh, develop over time with industry players. I've been in, lucky to be involved as a practice and then as an individual all the way through that, is to really provide compelling evidence of A, what the problem is, um, B, what the best practice models are globally, C, what the shifts globally have been, and that has been included recognition that housing is essential infrastructure for um, our, our communities. And in turn, um, that led to us being able to provide when um, Infrastructure Australia was uh, formed, the states also put in place, uh, if you like, um, matching organisations. And Infrastructure Victoria undertook a very extensive formulation of what its priorities should be. And we were able to provide that really good research to them. And they agreed that infrastructure was essential uh, in infrastructure uh, that was essential for our city included affordable housing. And not just affordable housing, but affordable housing of the right type in the right location uh, in, uh, to the right criteria for the right sort of households at the right price, for rent primarily. Um, and in fact got to the point of saying of the top three priorities for infrastructure investment in Victoria, housing was one of the top three, along with the Metro, which got, had already got funded, and the North East Link, which had already got funded. So, uh, more recently, and the great thing about that is it changes the return profile that is needed on the housing also, because um, risk is seen to be much lower for infrastructure than it is for speculative property. Um, and so, and patient investment is also encouraged in infrastructure, whether it's a pipeline or a freeway or a whatever, then uh, for um, uh, speculative um, uh, investment. So, when Victoria went into um, its um, second lockdown last year and the government started to think about what should it invest in to bring Victoria out of its um, uh, recession. I was fortunate enough to have been invited to be on a task force with the um, Director of Housing to help build a business case and um, uh, identify risks and opportunities. And we were able to take what was originally going to be a New South Wales benchmark of 900 million and change that to 5.3 billion as a, as, a, um, as a bid. And we were successful in getting that uh, funding for 12,000 dwellings in Victoria. Further, a not-for-profit that I'm part of, Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, had supported a project with um, Brotherhood of St Lawrence and uh, supported again through university research a couple of years prior looking at vulnerable households in the west of Melbourne who were living in poor energy performing houses and the impact that that had on both their living costs and their health. Um, the early research had come back and was again a compelling case for investment. And um, because again that research was there and ready, we were opportunistically able to secure $500 million of investment um, in uh, further expanding that program. So by having really good and real and current research with all the questions answered, we were able to eliminate the majority of risks for politicians and show the value, but also get the necessary people within the tent supportive of the uh, propositions. I, I, I guess Thanks, Rob. I mean, that's a major achievement to get that policy shift. And I guess the thing there is to, to you, Claire, um, to have those things ready, if you like. If we've now finally got the bucket of money in the policy framework based on research, we also then have to have the things that we're going to build, the precedents, the examples of these alternative ways of doing things. And I think the strength um, in, in, in the projects that are going on in Melbourne is that um, if you could talk more about just how you've managed to go from 
I think from my understanding, a number of individual projects to a neighbourhood and then of course expanding into the public domain. The extent to which those precedents um, have actually been hand in hand with the theory and the analysis that you actually need both. And so could you just speak about that and how you're um, using those precedents to advocate for more of the same stuff or more of the even better stuff? Sure, um, and well done, Rob, on that 5.3 bill um, that we're <laughs> all um, getting busy with. It's very well overdue. Um, look, I think, um, I suppose, talking about some of the precedents, I what's been really interesting is, is the shift that I've... Um, noticed, I suppose, as an architect in the last um, even five years, I suppose, um, with some of the models that I mentioned before, you know, um, Kino's Assemble model and Nightingale and whatnot and how, um, I suppose what it was that you, is you can't always sit around and wait till those big policy shifts happen, which is kind of the thing that instigated and what put a fire under Jeremy, which then put a fire under a whole lot of other people to kind of make that change. And the challenge was, you know, the whole reason we needed to find um, seed funding is because no one would lend a bunch of architects money in the first place. Um, but then making those, you know, making those changes and setting new, new benchmarks as to what's acceptable in development. And so I think Jeremy himself would often say that there was nothing particularly remarkable about the commons. It was, you know, he kind of referred to it as kind of like Scandinavian houses from the housing from the 60s. You know, it was actually about this idea of taking it back to being intrinsically simple, well-built, thinking, you know, human-centric, um, all those kind of basic fundamentals that I think had been lost in the way that um, housing had become such a speculative commodity in Australia. And it was so much about investor stock. It, it didn't think about at all how people lived in these houses. And so some of the principles of, um, and then coupled with the kind of emergency, you know, the climate emergency that we're, we're currently finding ourselves in, um, of, you know, eradicating gas and, um, you know, pushing much higher than um, you know a six star rating which is what we currently need to comply with and what I found interesting to observe as someone that was coming in fairly new to the uh, working in the multi-residential sector was how um, these um, these initiatives um, were starting to kind of make the consumer more knowledgeable more discerning more demanding uh, which is fantastic you know for so long they were like oh real estate agents say this is what you get well that's what you get it was kind of tick a box how many bathrooms do you get how many car parks do you get and that was no longer the case that people were demanding more which started lifting the benchmark for the private developer and and obviously there's you know there's good and bad spectrums there's certainly lots of good developers in Australia but oh in Melbourne but so you started to see those kind of some of those principles that Nightingale had been, um, I'm not saying they were the, the necessarily the first to do it, but what they were advocating. And then secondly, what's been interesting is seeing how that's kind of filtered through into the social housing procurement. So government um, procurement for this big um, second wave or first and second wave um, affordable and social housing um, is that those principles um, are, are, have been filtering into there, whether that's a coincidence who knows but it's it's kind of very interesting how kind of um small initiatives grassroots initiatives can be kind of quite powerful in making a, you know systemic change across the sector yeah look and i i guess um thanks because i think it then goes to my third question i suppose which is to you kino which is to do with um the relationship with the client and Again, just to, to reflect for a moment, I think it's fair to say that we think of typologies of building usually in terms of built form, but associated with those typologies, you know, detached houses or duplexes or villa homes or blocks of apartments, of course, they are in fact, if you like, assemblages of the invisible systems as well. So alongside those are very finely tuned legal, financial, and for that matter, planning controls and so what you have is essentially all of these things coming together into really quite a, uh, an extraordinary inertia, actually, to change and make those new models. So your point about the coincidence, I think you should perhaps um, claim that it's not coincidence, that, you know, actually the procurement has recognised these benefits. And so what we're seeing is the breaking of those connections where you've got particular forms of speculative design where there's no connection necessarily between the architect and the end occupier. Uh, and now we're seeing these intermediate models where, and this is to you, Kino, 
where there is a, a series of ways beyond focus groups, beyond market segmentation or personae, which is the way the market tends to deal with this, but the way that you have managed to engage with the end occupants and to, if you like, co-create um, exactly what goes into those buildings, which is exactly the sort of model I think that Claire, you were saying, has started to be picked up by public housing providers. So, so Kino, <laughs> um, to, to the question of how you engage with uh, multiple clients to um, still you know, behave as an architect and actually come up with a design, <laughs> a challenge. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks uh, for that question. And, and I, I definitely uh, mirror Claire's comments, uh, Rob. Congratulations on your involvement in getting that 5.3 billion. It's just the most fantastic uh, thing for the state, I reckon. Um, but look, uh, sort of stepping back, I, um, one of the reasons that we found at Assemble Papers uh, was very much in response to the fact that at the time, and this is, you know, mid 2000s, um, the quality of multi-residential was appalling in Melbourne. It really, really was. And I guess what we tried to do is we thought, let's try and build a bit of an advocacy platform. A, to, um, I suppose, try and basically to try and lift the kind of level of dialogue around housing. I mean, the tagline of Assemble Papers is the culture of living closer together. And it really, I suppose, our idea was the best way to... Um, I suppose, encourage positive change is to expose the right people to good ideas. So we use that. Um, and in fact, the, the current Assemble team still does, I'm sure, is we actually used to send all the Assemble papers when we printed them to councils and to you know, people in positions of power. But also it's about advocating to uh, consumers because you know, the, the reason I think that development, the quality of developments has improved greatly over the last few years in Melbourne is because there's been a shift from uh, uh, apartments being a sort of a financial product purely for investors, and there's been a shift to actually being a, um, an alternative housing for owner occupiers. And I think that uh, the owner occupier market and even the investors now are demanding better. You know, they're saying, you know, can we not do, you know, have something better? And I think it's helped to lift sort of everything up. Um, and, you know, our role as architects is that we are always wanting to, you know, deliver, you know, something of high quality. But in order to deliver high quality housing, you need clients who want to deliver high quality housing. So I guess uh, in a sort of roundabout way, I'm saying that, you know, I think Assembled Papers has had, you know, a little bit of influence. I, I'm hoping it's had some positive influence in really lifting the kind of dialogue. And of course, the work that Jeremy and Claire and the rest of the Nightingale team has really helped elevate um, and of course, advocates like Rob as well. Uh, and I think we're heading on the right trajectory, to be perfectly honest, around the notions of quality. Um, and, you know, I think now with the big housing build and models like Assemble and their new partnership with um, Housing Choices, I think, you know, this idea of quality and affordability is starting to emerge in a positive kind of way as well. Thanks, Kino. Do we have any chat questions? No, no chat questions. <laughs> okay. Could I, could In that I case, add, yes, please. Could I I'm just add up. to Kino's um, and Claire's points? So I think it's been a little bit of a back to the future, but, you know, if you think back to the 80s, Melbourne had some terrible architecture with project management driven, and then Nonda did his um, Franklin Street um, project and showed the value add of design-led, um, admittedly quirky through a contemporary lens, but still holds its own and it was sort of like we'd lost that mojo for a while and uh, and it took architects to say they had to get outside their bubble and and do something um, in the John Kennedy um, you know for those in the AFL foot, uh, history and um, and uh, what uh, Kino and Claire have demonstrated is architects that are doing something um, you know, and, and trying to propose scalable alternatives. Um, I'm really encouraged too by the institutions coming into, say, the assemble model, um, because um, they're, they're um, a different sort of investor. They're patient and longer term. And it's in their interest that the value of the property's worth more in 20 years than it's worth now. And that will only come by doing the research about uh, what, where, why, and for whom, um, you know, and asking those questions rather than what sold last week 
Um, and um, um, well, we're out, we're selling to foreign markets anyway. They won't know, you know. Like, um, and we're all the poorer for that commodity-based, uninformed, you know, uh, product. So I'm encouraged by that shift, but it's very slow at the moment still. Um, I have one more question, if I may, which is to do with the role of uh, the local authorities um, and the extent to which, I mean, we're probably all familiar with the uh, incentives that are provided, say, in Berlin in terms of site acquisition or assembly or concessional planning requirements for Bauer Group and so We didn't, fortunately, end up going through VCAT or anything like that, but it was still an ex exceptionally complicated project and took... Uh, was and we didn't feel it needed to be, you know, particularly that hard. Um, and obviously, you know, we've got a very good working relationship with Moreland, so this is certainly not, not being disrespectful uh, at all to to the um, to local council. But I think it, it's that irony sometimes. It's a bit like you know we see it even in single residential. I'm sometimes um, think, oh, let's leave our title block off and don't show that this project, you know, this house that we're putting through council is done by an architect because. It's it's so frustrating sometimes that you put in a good body, you know, piece of work, whether it be a house or an apartment building, and then the council kind of keeps trying to push the bar, which is great, but sometimes it's, um, whereas then you see how much rubbish, to be frank, is still getting through um, across the board and doesn't get, you know, it's, it's almost... I don't know, I find that they're kind of saying, oh, what, how much more can we get out of these people? Um, you know, particularly when, you know, we were bringing, you know, 15% affordable housing and those kind of things. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a general comment across um, across all uh, areas of work, single res and multi-res, but I, I still I, I still think that, that we need, um, you know, we need more efficient planning um, systems in place. And, and as, as developers know, time is money. We can't afford to be waiting, you know, even if it is, um, you know, a user pays, you know, higher premiums to get things done in a much quicker um, manner. It's just, it's, it's um, incredibly slow. And I think the killer for, and, and the, the killer often for these developments, because even though we had kind of, you know, um, seed equity, and then we've got, you know, bank finance and mezzanine finance, you know, it's just millions and millions of dollars on projects like that in our, in your finance costs, and every month costs you know, a lot. So um, particularly at kind of the end of peak debt. So, you know, we do need to find methodologies. And I think, you know, it sounds like, you know, that there have been particular kind of competitions run recently with the OVGA. And I know there's been some run in Sydney in New South Wales to try and establish almost kind of templates or typologies that can hopefully fast track that, that process. And I think that that's really essential um, for the sake of affordability as much as for the sake of, because that the cost, you know, the cost of construction generally can't come down. We've got land acquisition, unless we're kind of, you know, joint venturing or something and getting access to kind of inexpensive land or, or gifted land from government. Um, you know, we've got to look at what levers we can pull to bring the cost of delivering housing down. So further to what Claire said, I guess, um, the, so Kino, who ends up paying for these long delays in planning are ultimately the end user. It ends up being, you know, the apartment ends up costing more money. And I think that's very unfortunate. And look, I am pleased to see uh, some councils are attempting to improve things and putting more design focus. We're fortunate to be the first project approved under the Moreland's new uh, design excellence scorecard. So the idea with that is that if, if your building or your design is able to achieve certain social design, sustainability um, and accessibility uh, criteria, that there's a slightly, potentially slightly private uh, process. And so I'm encouraged by that. I'm also encouraged by the fact that, um, you know, there is a shifting towards design quality in the councils that we deal with, which is, which is also very positive. But we really do need to take a hard look at the planning process and the fact that it does drag on so long. And that is definitely, as Claire said, it is a big financial burden on the end users of the building. You know, developers not absorbing it, it's the end user ultimately who's absorbing this. And, and really, I think that, that that's a very unfortunate thing. And, and that will help. Um, if we can help that process, we'll certainly be able to bring the, the cost of housing down a little bit. We've been given the clear to talk for a few more minutes, Rob, so... <laughs> oh, well, fantastic. I was going to say, look, um, the, there's some really encouraging uh, precedent work. I mean, the city of Port Phillip in Melbourne has long uh, championed 
um, affordable housing within its community and putting its lazy land to work. Um, we've done a couple of projects in airspace above local retail car parks, for example, uh, to that purpose. Um, the inner city councils have all got together to develop a toolbox to f uh, be able to fast track in particular responses and partnerships with government around um, uh, a, a homelessness strategy. And uh, importantly, philanthropic groups have also got together with uh, inner city councils um, and to pool their resources and partner with government to address that. And there's some really exciting announcements coming soon on that. And the, uh, the group that I'm with has also been funding scalable projects. So it's, a, for example, uh, with the city of Darabin, uh, as the successful council put in a million dollars to make it possible with HCA, who Claire's working with, um, uh, and uh, who Kino's working with, um, a uh, project again in the airspace um, behind the Preston Town, Town Hall for I think 41 units. Um, uh, so leveraging 1 million into 13 million. Um, and uh, this year are going to the state to say we need to look at the lazy land that's used just for commuter car parking at railway stations and look at the airspace there and we'll put a million dollars in again to see if we can help unpack that and again, that's based on uh, work done through the University of Melbourne's research showing that there's an enormous amount of these sites um, close to really good public transport uh, all around our cities um, that could be um, adapted to this purpose. So I think the, the role of philanthropy, community, institutions, local government, state and business and communities more generally all need to come together more. We all need to find a dialect. We're getting there, slowly but surely. And we've just got to accept that, in a lot of cases, local government don't have the skills uh, to address these things all the time. But also, we are still grappling with the fact that people have the, and developers have this problem of not understanding what affordable housing is and see it as bringing poverty to uh, their areas, which, um, they think might be contagious um, and therefore should be objected to too often. Um, so we've got to get people over that and saying, no, that's the person that serves you your coffee, the person that's looking after your child in childcare, the person that you're transacting over your new pair of jeans. You know, these are all people who cannot afford rental accommodation in your city anymore. Well, Rob, I think that was a perfect wrap-up. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, really, as I, as I said at the beginning, in terms of the symposium um, kicking off uh, this chair in architectural design leadership, I think um, with the three of you, it, it's really, really painted out the complete scope, you know, as we've said, from values through to research, through to the role and need for prototypes to build trust and then the changes in relationships with clients but also end users, back to then, if you like, that higher level government policy and even the definition of what is essential infrastructure essentially to the city. That's, that's, the, full, that's the full gamut, I would have thought, that will be explored over the next few years with this chair, which of course is relying on philanthropy. So I think, I think we've just about covered it. And so I'd just like to profusely thank our three um, guests and speakers and um, I think this is all going to be online at some point, I'm assured it is, and I think we can upload some references and other papers and so on. Rob's written some brilliant analyses recently, so um, if you'll join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>